Good morning, everyone, and welcome to NED Group Investments Insights. My name is Robin Johnson. I'm a, I am head of investments for NED Group Investments with our best of breed range. And today, um, I, I'm happy to have uh, Marco Colantonio from Resolution Capital with us, who are the portfolio managers and our partner on the Glo NED Group Investments Global Property Fund. Now, I consistently allude to Resolution as the best global REIT managers in the world. I have a bit of experience in selecting global REIT funds uh, as in my previous life, and I didn't wasn't able to find a manager that could consistently outperform the benchmark. And within Resolution Capital, we're really proud to partner with them as they consistently done that since they founded the strategy global reach strategy back in 2006. Now Mark and Marco um, and Andrew Parsons founded uh, Resolution Capital when um, after working together at Lendlease um, back in 2004 and they launched the global reach strategy in 2006. Um, their track record has been built um, since inception by focusing on quality buildings, um, sensible management, but more importantly, strong balance sheets, um, looking at properties that will continue to provide a, a stable level of cash flow through, through rental income, something that has become incredibly important as we've gone through the COVID-19 crisis. Now, despite the global property index rebounding 10% in the second quarter, the sector has still suffered a decline of 21% year to date. And investors still remain wary of the certainty in relation to the rental income from the sector. It's understandable given the withdrawal of interim dividends and the reluctance of REIT management to provide guidance for the future. Now, um, we've also been hit within Europe by the closure of open-ended unit trusts, which still remain closed to investors, or close to redemptions. It means investors simply can't get their money back. Now, this is not the case with listed property funds. Generally, the liquidity in the global market is, is much better, and albeit with a short-term impact on market price volatility. And both structures, open-ended or closed-ended, are subject to the same fundamental drivers of the underlying property valuation. With that, I'm going to have and on, on to Marco today um, to give us a brief rundown of, of their views on the global REIT market and what's been driving the performance of the fund over the last um, short period. So Marco, thanks for joining us all the way from Australia and um, I'll hand over to you now. Thanks Robin and good morning everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, so I'll cover off uh, today just a quick um, uh, update on recent market performance. Uh, and uh, our views on the various real estate sectors around the world. Uh, I'll quickly profile a stock that is in our portfolio to hopefully give you a flavour of the type of investments that uh, we have uh, and talk about portfolio positioning. So um, as Robin mentioned, uh, we had a bit of a relief rally in the most recent quarter ending 30th of June. The market was up about 10% and um, uh, obviously many of the, the hardest hit subsectors from the prior quarter regained some of their losses. So you can see this um, chart um, uh, on, in terms of the sectors that performed well in this most recent quarter. Uh, healthcare, retail were, um, and hotels were amongst the hardest hit in the prior quarter. Uh, and uh, they rebounded uh, and regained some of their losses uh, during this most recent quarter. Um, clearly there was a, um, a massive policy okay. response. Can I yes. in, in, interrupt? Sorry, you broke up again. Would you mind just going back to you? You mentioned that um, uh, the market had rebounded by 10% and then we lost you for, to, to the connection. Okay. If, um, if it helps, would you switch your video off and that might Im improve the connection? Sure, okay, I can do that. Thank you. So um, uh, some of the sectors that were most hard hit in the prior quarter, were the ones that uh, regained some ground in this most recent quarter, uh, particularly uh, healthcare, retail, and the hotel sectors. Uh, and that was in response to a huge amount of uh, policy response, both fiscal and monetary policy that uh, I guess uh, underwrote or backstopped some of the markets. And um, uh, also a gradual easing of some of the lockdowns and the ebb and flow of some uh, hopes on, on the vaccine front. 
um, uh, it certainly helped uh, help the markets to some extent. Um, and, and so we did see a, a reasonable um, uh, rebound, but as uh, Rob mentioned earlier, over the last 12 months, uh, the sector is still down about uh, close to 20%. And it's just interesting to look, if you break down the market movement um, since the beginning of COVID, so since the, let's call it since the end of uh, February of 2020, um, what we've done here is we've broken up the, um, uh, the, the sectors that have done the, the best, which are the winners in the dark green line and the sectors that are, um, have done the worst. The retail and hotel have been, have been the worst affected segments and the data centers, towers and industrial, residential and self-storage have been the, the best. Now, um, obviously in the early part of uh, the COVID pandemic, both sec all sectors really um, felt uh, some, some downward uh, pressure, but um, the retail and hotel segment was down close to 40, 50% in, 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 uh, at, the, at its extreme. Uh, whereas the, the winning sectors, data centers, towers, industrial, residential, self-storage have regained almost all of their, their losses now back to, back to uh, pre-COVID levels. And the retail and hotel segment is uh, still down around about 30% from their lows, uh, from, sorry, from, from their uh, pre-COVID levels. And in terms of positioning of our portfolio, um, we going into COVID, uh, we had about 50% of our portfolio in that, that what we call the winners segment of the market, uh, data centers, towers, industrials, residential self storage. Only about 11% of our portfolio was in retail and hotels. Um, uh, so that just gives you a flavor of um, where we were positioned uh, uh, going into COVID. Uh, and I'll, um, I wanted to just highlight a couple of uh, points about this crisis that are different to 2008 and the global financial crisis. And the most obvious one is that um, uh, this is not a credit crisis. Partly uh, two, two really important points of difference. Firstly, that the REITs went into this crisis with much better balance sheets than they did in 2008. Um, uh, leverage was lower, it was much better structured in the form of longer duration debt uh, and um, uh, more diversified sources of debt and, and well hedged. Um, uh, so that uh, is a much better position to be going into a crisis than, than we saw in the, prior, uh, in the prior crisis. And secondly, as I said, we had a massive policy response, uh, including from the US Fed and others, to keep the debt markets functioning. So while we did see spreads blow out quite uh, dramatically, uh, as you can see on this chart, um, even in the darkest days of uh, late March, some of the better quality credit REITs were able to access the debt capital markets um, and uh, were uh, issuing 10-year you know, paper uh, at sub 5% all-in cost. So about you know, 300, basis, 300 uh, basis points uh, spreads over pretty low base rates. Um, but it was really important that the, the, the capital, the debt capital markets were continuing to function. And that to a large extent uh, was really important for equities markets. And so what we have not seen to any large extent and anywhere near the same extent that what we saw in 2008 is we have not seen the emergency capital raisings and those uh, uh, forced asset sales or forced equity raisings from uh, the lenders. Uh, we have seen some equity raisings, but um, they've mostly been from the stronger performing stocks. Um, and some of them are listed here, Invitation Homes, which I'll talk about in a moment, Seagrow, Unite, uh, all those raised equity really from a position of strength and in order to basically build their war chests to be opportunistic in this environment and, and perhaps take advantage of the distress of others. Uh, and um, not to say we haven't seen some uh, uh, discount equity raisings like vicinity, but, uh, the Australian mall company, but most of the, the winning sectors, residential, industrial, uh, student housing in the case of Unite, have held up pretty well and were able to raise uh, equity uh, as well as debt uh, and um, uh, to, to be opportunistic uh, in, uh, in, in this environment. There hasn't been a lot of asset sales yet. Uh, and I, I guess one of the consequences of um, the, um, uh, the Fed stepping in to backstop the credit markets has been that uh, there has not been too many forced sales. So we've been, um, I guess there's been a bit of a seller's strike as well as a buyer's strike. Buyers are approaching the market with a lot of caution, uh, but there hasn't been the forced sellers. 
So we haven't really seen a lot of property transactions yet. Um, the REIT market remains very liquid and uh, the equity and debt markets have been open for uh, the better quality REITs. Now a lot of press about uh, rent collection. It's very topical uh, and uh, clearly the press focuses at the uh, bottom end of the spectrum, which is uh, particularly in the retail and hotels where a lot of tenants are not in a position to pay the rent that they were paying previously. Obviously, if they haven't been open um, or haven't been able to accept guests in hotels, uh, there's no revenue and therefore uh, they have been unable to pay rent. And in many cases, governments have mandated uh, rent abatement schemes um, that have uh, required the landlords to come to the party uh, and uh, reduce rents while tenants are, uh, um, are suffering significant cash flow uh, duress. Um, but as this table on the right hand side shows is that it's really only retail and hotels at the bottom end of the spectrum where you know hotels literally had you know virtually no uh, rent collected in in the period of uh, may um, the more discretionary end of retail in malls had about 18 percent collection for those that uh, disclosed it uh, and uh, in the and the, the more um, uh, non-discretionary re uh, retail operators in the US strip centres were around about 60% collection. But above that, you had mostly um, in the low 90s uh, to up towards 100% rent collection for many of the other uh, sectors of uh, um, the uh, global REIT market. So it, it's really worth, um, uh, and I'll talk again a little bit later on about portfolio positioning, but uh, we, we were able to position the portfolio and we were already positioned largely um, in the segments that have been more resilient um, in the shape of the German residential, the data centers, some life science office buildings uh, and, uh, and US residential segments and, and industrial as well. And uh, in, in any recession, we typically see um, a reduction in construction levels. And it's, it's to some extent a double-edged sword. Uh, construction is usually a large employer, so uh, it's not great for the overall employment market, but ultimately uh, it is a, a positive for uh, long-term rental landlords, and that is because it effectively means that there's less construction, less competitive supply coming into the market in the coming years. Um, and importantly, um, what this chart shows is aggregate construction starts in the US since 1984, and in particular, the light blue line shows the uh, construction starts as a percentage of inventory, as a percentage of existing stock. And uh, as you can see in most other cycles, uh, during the, the strongest part of the uh, economic recovery, you will see the um, construction levels rise well above historical averages, and then it dips down below. This cycle, we, we didn't see uh, a huge spike in construction as a percentage of inventory as we have seen in previous cycles. So we went into this cycle with uh, relatively uh, moderate levels of construction. Um, most of that was in the retail segment. So um, uh, that was an, an aberration, obviously, because retail is experiencing some structural challenges. But it's important to point out that um, uh, this should bode well for the medium term um, positioning for landlords in that uh, uh, certainly uh, speculative construction will um, uh, uh, decline. And, and that means that there's less competition going forward. So a couple of the, the sectors, just to cover off on a couple of, the, couple of the specifics of the sectors, obviously hotels, as I mentioned, travel halts has, has really meant that uh, revenues have been absolutely crunched. Occupancy levels are down you know, 70, 80 percent um, during April and May and uh, average daily room rates uh, have fallen significantly as well. Uh, and um, uh, there's a lot of questions about whether uh, anyone will ever travel again. Uh, we've heard these um, questions being raised before, obviously uh, around 9-11, um, uh, ultimately humans do want to interact and do travel. Uh, if, if there's one point in a cycle that we do think hotels become somewhat interesting is when there is extreme uh, distress and dislocation. So we are keeping a keen eye on um, opportunities within the hotel sector. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that they are trading at deep discounts to replacement cost. And another reason is that um, uh, what you typically find is, and what we expect to see is a reduction in room supply as either existing hotels uh, get converted to other uses or uh, many owners just give up uh, on the sector altogether and, um, and mothball their hotels. Um, so we'll probably will see a reduction in hotels. 
really important though um, to to make sure that we if you're investing in hotels that you uh, stick to companies that have got very strong balance sheets and uh, so the one hotel stock that we have in our portfolio at the moment which is only one percent of the portfolio but um, uh, it, it basically has almost no debt so really important to be focused on the balance sheets for uh, for hotels uh, retail uh, as we've talked about um, in previous uh, webinars one of the more structurally challenged segments of the real estate market and therefore a relatively small exposure for our portfolio uh, uh, very little exposure at all to the discretionary end of retail um, the retail that we do own is more focused on non-discretionary more supermarket oriented uh, retail as well as service oriented retail that um, services that you can't get over the internet um, and uh, clearly that structural challenge has been accelerated as uh, shutdowns have occurred and so we've seen a pickup in online shopping and uh, on top of that we've had um, uh, the um, cash flows for many of the retailers significantly curtailed and, and therefore bankruptcies have increased uh, and there's an expectation that 2020 will see a spike in uh, in bankruptcies uh, a couple of points to, to to mention on retail is that we did see into which is the uk listed more company finally fall into uh, administration uh, i would say that that uh, occurred uh, was well, well and truly uh, on track to happen regardless of COVID. I guess it accelerated during co uh, because of COVID, but it probably would have happened anyway. Uh, Into was actively trying to raise um, equity um, late last year and early this year and was, una was unable to. Uh, it's a, um, a, an example of the structural challenges obviously in, in retail with U the UK being one of the more highly uh, penetrated e-commerce markets in the world. Um, as well as I guess um, uh, an example of a, a company in, in the retail space which had what well, probably would have been regarded as relatively moderate uh, leverage uh, five years ago um, but in the face of those structural challenges and the increased level of capital required from retail landlords to um, uh, invest in their properties to keep them um, uh, competitive as well as now the, the, the cyclical challenge and, and um, the requirement for landlords to um, provide capital to their tenants um, ultimately proved to be um, terminal for the likes of Into. But having said that retail, um, our view is that retail will still exist uh, and that omni-channel is um, uh, very very much the the focus of many many of the better retailers they'll just need less physical space but they will need some physical space so it's important to stay focused on the opportunities potentially in that in that um, uh, sector of the um, real estate market uh, but again focused on the ones that have the best balance sheets Turning to healthcare, uh, look, our main exposure within healthcare is um, is really in the in the life science office buildings and uh, medical office space. Uh, seniors housing is the area that's really felt the most pain, and that's obviously because uh, COVID has hit that uh, age cohort in particular. Um, and so you you typically see an average of three to four percent per uh, per month move out um, uh, in uh, in seniors housing. Um, the quarantine requirements have meant that they've had to limit the, the number of uh, new residents coming in. And so, as you can see in this chart, occupancy levels have dipped by um, you know, four to 500 basis points um, very, very quickly. And that's put pressure on the operators. And, um, and so there's been some significant uh, pr uh, stress in the seniors housing component um, of um, the, the real estate market. Uh, on the positive, some of the winners, logistics, has um, gone from strength to strength. Obviously, uh, it's been a, uh, a segment that has been enjoying the benefits or the tailwinds of the growth in e-commerce for a number of years now, and that's really just accelerated. And in addition to that, what we've seen is more and more uh, talk of um, manufacturers and, and um, retailers building up inventory levels in order to offset the risk of future supply chain disruptions that we've seen, whether it's from due, to, due to the trade war uh, or whether it's due to COVID uh, travel restrictions. Um, so that is expected to drive further increased demand and, um, um, and therefore the logistics REITs have performed quite strongly and have had very high rent collection statistics um, during this period. Similarly, data centers, one of the winners and the significant increase in demand 
um, for for uh, data um, because of uh, because we're all working from home because we're doing these webinars as an example um, and there's uh, enormous amount of uh, data that's being consumed uh, and the uh, expected spend on cloud infrastructure as we, we move more and more to the cloud uh, and mobile data usage uh, increasing has, um, has just underpinned that secular demand for uh, both data centers and cell towers. And um, uh, so this, this is a, a segment of the, um, the real estate market that we think will continue to perform uh, quite strongly. Office is one interesting one that's getting a lot of press as well. Uh, obviously, the um, work from home thematic is uh, of uh, high um, interest and um, uh, people are calling the end of the office. Uh, our view, and, and this is one segment of the market that we did reduce our exposure to uh, quite early on in the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, and it wasn't necessarily because of those structural headwinds, but it was more about the economic contraction. Um, uh, office never does well in a in a recession, and um, and so we reduced our exposure quite significantly after a period of very strong rent growth and um, you know low unemployment. Um, as soon as the signs of the the um, impact of the recession was going to take place, um, we reduced our exposure. But there's no doubt uh, that this work from home thematic will uh, add another. Um, uh, headwind for office landlords as as larger tenants. Um, bring up work from home as a uh, an excuse to uh, bargain to drive a, a harder bargain on their rent negotiations. And uh, residential has really um, been one of the more stable segments of the market, um, and, and really only been reinforced by this work from home um, during the period of uh, the lockdowns. And uh, the, the the real question really remains, particularly in the U.S. residential scene, is. Um, um, whether the um, tenants are continue to be able to pay the rent uh, as they lose their jobs. And um, uh, I guess it'd be interesting just to uh, continue on with uh, the um, uh, an example of a stock that we think is an interesting um, way that we have mitigated that risk, and that is Invitation Homes, which is um, uh, an owner of US single family residential uh, as opposed to we think the the, the um, uh, what we like about the uh, single family home segment compared to other residential exposures in the US which are more multifamily oriented is uh, that it's relatively supply constrained and relatively affordable rents so the rents in the invitations portfolio is around about 1600 US dollars a month and rent to income ratio uh, income ratios are in the low 20 percent range so that's uh, compared to some of the coastal markets where you're renting apartments for um, circa uh, up to three thousand dollars a month or more and um, uh, rent to income ratios are closer to the high 20 percent range it's a relatively affordable rents uh, you typically get a longer length of stay in uh, in the single family homes as opposed to apartment renters I mean, you typically stay for three years versus 1.8 years in apartments so as a landlord you have uh, less downtime and and typically less uh, capex spent on uh, on every turn uh, and it's also the potential beneficiary of the demographic trends uh, as the millennial generation uh, ages um, and the millennial generation is more inclined to rent. And as they move towards uh, a later stage in their life or begin to have families, there's an expectation that um, uh, they will uh, uh, increase the demand pool for uh, single family residential. It could also potentially be a beneficiary of the work from home trend. Um, if people are expected to spend more time at home, then they may opt for less dense housing options. And um, uh, so it's a, uh, potentially a beneficiary for, for that, that trend as well. Um, invitation Homes has, has experienced a very high rent collection, the 96, 97% rent collection during the crisis. And in fact, even during the crisis, as you can see in the right, bottom right of this slide, uh, they've increased their occupancy to 97.5% to a new record high. Um, and they're still achieving rent increases in the in the low 3% range, even on the, on the um, uh, rent negotiations they've conducted during um, uh, April and May. Uh, so we can buy this portfolio on a net rental yield in the low 4% range, um, which we think is pr a pretty attractive pricing for the uh, relative resiliency of the cash flow. Um, and it is uh, a 5% position uh, in our portfolio. So in terms of the outlook, um, 
I guess um, it's fair to say that um, there's a lot of question marks out, uh, in, in relation to um, the economy and um, and how things will will um, uh, progress with the the uh, with the virus. But um, it's really important to point out that the balance sheets that we went in, we went into the REITs went into the uh, crisis with re really good balance sheets. Um, uh, we um, are pleased that the debt and equity markets have remained open for the better quality REITs. Uh, and uh, at the moment, certainly listed REITs seem to be trading at a, a discount to the um, unlisted property, and um, we we are a very liquid form of, of uh, global real estate exposures, um, which, uh, as Rob was pointing out earlier, is a really important point of difference compared to many of the um, uh, unlisted property funds that are frozen redemptions. We've never uh, frozen redemptions. So um, based on our investment process, we typically outperform uh, in uh, falling markets, and um, that's certainly been the case over the last uh, 12 months, where the market's down by about 21%, um, and uh, our uh, relative performance has been around about positive 900 basis points, um, and over the longer term, um, uh, around about uh, 370 basis points of uh, relative outperformance. Um, just touching really again on uh, our portfolio positioning, um, as, as I started off mentioning, there's uh, there's winners and losers in the um, global REIT sector. Um, our our positioning, um, as you can see on the left hand side of this slide, uh, residential, which we think is focused on uh, affordable uh, and supply constrained residential exposures, is around 26% of the portfolio. Uh, industrial is a beneficiary of e-commerce, uh, and data centres is a, is a beneficiary of um, the digitization of the economy. So combined 27% uh, uh, of the exposure is, is to um, uh, industrial and, and data centers, which is really uh, accommodating the, the new economy. Um, and the rest is a, a, a mix of um, some offices with uh, interesting and unique exposures, including uh, life science offices. Many of the tenants uh, in, in the life science office component of our portfolio are involved in researching um, uh, vaccines and therapeutics for COVID as well as many other diseases. Uh, so it's been a very resilient part of the office segment of our exposure. Um, and um, healthcare, including medical office buildings, uh, self-storage, very resilient and uh, low capex. Um, so we think that um, the uh, global REIT market remains uh, an effective um, uh, diversification for, um, uh, for investors with uh, reasonably good balance sheets and uh, and liquidity, um, with the ability to um, tilt the portfolio to the most resilient parts of um, uh, the um, uh, the real estate market. So with that, um, I'll uh, I'll leave it at that and um, hand over to you, Rob, for questions. Well, thank you very much, Marco, um, for that uh, comprehensive rundown of most of the sectors um, or subsectors within the global REIT universe. Can I ask you to put your video back on, please? And I think you can stop sharing the slides now um, as we go into the Q&A. So for everybody who's joined, you can uh, submit a question for Marco on the right hand side there in the Q&A pane. We had a few questions come in whilst we were talking. Um, firstly, Around the world, there's been a few calls from the REIT market to regulators or revenue services to give them a bit of leeway in in, uh, in, in the constraints or restraints that keep them to their REIT status. Is there any further developments there? Do you think um, that'll be um, relaxed at all? Yeah, so I think you might be referring to uh, in Singapore, for example, where there has been the um, the Singaporean government has a statutory limit um, of 45% loan to value ratio for uh, to be able to maintain qualification for REIT status, and they did um, uh, relax that rule uh, in the event that you know if there was an expectation that that uh, asset values were going to fall quite significantly, um, they didn't want the REITs to be in a position to uh, have to go out and do emergency capital raisings just to maintain their REIT status. Um, so far, they haven't had to. Uh, we haven't really seen aggressive falls in asset values. As I said, there's sort of a, a lull in transactions, and um, we've seen some declines in asset values, but um, not as dramatic to trigger that yet. Uh, our fear in relation to that is, uh, particularly in in Singapore, which is a predominantly externally managed 
market is that many of the REIT managers will just use that extra um, uh, loan to value ratio headroom that they've got because uh, it's a permanent uh, uh, relaxation of that rule. Um, and they'll probably use all of that capacity and take their leverage right up to 55% and then we'll see in the next cycle that they'll have some problems. And um, so we've stayed um, stayed away from that. Um, uh, but um, yes, there has been some concessions by some of the regulators to make sure that um, there, there isn't uh, any uh, distressed uh, capital raisings uh, to, to meet their REIT qualification status. Okay, thank you. And um, we'll stay in that part of the world for now. And, and a couple of questions that came through about Hong Kong and whether um, I see you introduced or well, reintroduced exposure there in, in, in the early part of this year. Um, can you just give us a, a comment on the relative attraction and, and, um, and what are the prospects for that area given what's happening with China at the moment? Yes, yeah, so um, we looked at Hong Kong as an opportunity partly because um, look, we, we'd almost exited, completely exited or reduced our, our holdings significantly um, uh, a bit over a year ago now when the um, social unrest really began to uh, disrupt the local market there. And, um, and so the stocks began to underperform well and truly before COVID was um, on the radar screen. Um, and um, uh, and then when COVID came, obviously it hit that part of that region of the world uh, first. Um, so our view was that um, many of the stocks had been hit pretty hard very early. Um, there was already very low expectations. There was already rent collection issues, particularly in retail in, in Hong Kong. Um, and um, the, the economy was in recession um, uh, while the rest of the world kept on powering on. Um, so it was an evaluation opportunity for us, um, as well as um, uh, you know, Hong Kong was perhaps the worst hit region when SARS hit um, in 03 and, uh, and so we've seen that economy continue and that um, you know, the people of Hong Kong um, managed, managed through that and even though there hasn't been a, a vaccine yet, um, Hong Kong continued to, um, to function. Uh, quite effectively. So one of the regions of the world that we thought had, um, uh, uh, you know, was, was reasonably well prepared to and and um, uh, a population that had been through that and knew how to re respond. Uh, and then adding to that, the, the fact that the um, balance sheets of the Hong Kong names are in very, very good shape. Um, uh, so we saw it as a, a deeply discounted opportunity to re-enter the Hong Kong market um, with uh, companies that are very focused on um, uh, uh, certain segments of the market that are non-discretionary retail like Link REIT uh, and um, uh, Sun and Kai which is a uh, Hong Kong residential property, diversified property company but with some residential uh, development um, with a very very low cost land bank, very strong balance sheet and the opportunity to outperform um, as um, other parts of the world um, uh, began to slow down. Okay, thank you. Um, and some other questions have come through on the office component of the portfolio. You still hold 13% there. Would you just give us a quick rundown of, of why your office portfolio won't be as um, badly affected by any potential vacancies? Yeah, sure. So um, it's interesting. So it's 13%, it's you're quite correct. And um, of that, about 5% of that is in a company called Alexandria, which is a life science office focused REIT. Uh, so uh, it's probably mislabeled by the index uh, as, as an office stock because you could easily put that in the healthcare segment um, because some of the more diversified healthcare REITs um, own uh, or components of their portfolio uh, own uh, life science um, uh, buildings. So um, it's, uh, we think, a very resilient uh, um, sub-segment of the office market, even if it is mislabeled. Um, uh, there's also uh, about a 3% exposure to uh, a company called Easterly Government Properties, and that is 100% um, uh, leased to the US government. Uh, in a range of different locations, somewhat specialised buildings in the form of either courthouses or uh, FBI field offices, um, whereby um, uh, upon lease expiry, it's not a generic office building. And uh, so throughout the history of um, uh, Easterly Government properties, they've had pretty close to 100% uh, rent re uh, lease renewal as, as the government leases expire um, and um, it's a relatively modern portfolio, uh, relatively low capex uh, and a roughly a 5% yield um, uh, from essentially 100% rental backed by the US government. So a nice spread to uh, the US um, uh, um, 
uh, bond rate. So um, we think it's a, a very resilient uh, uh, way to play the office markets in uh, in the US. Have you uh, have you been on any visits to any of these FBI field offices? <laughs> Not yet, no. Um, but uh, that's on that's on uh, that's on the agenda once we can fly again. Just uh, joking aside, I assume that you, you know you mentioned the Alexandria and 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 places like the FBI offices. They have to have specialist infrastructure within the buildings that is very hard to replicate. It is, and and it adds it adds. Um, uh, cost as well to um, to develop those buildings, and so therefore um, uh, you're quite right. The competitive um, uh, set of of buildings that the tenants can go to when their lease expires uh, is just is just less. You know, so um, you know the FBI field officers have to have blast proof windows and setbacks from the street. Um, so if there's a building across the road that comes up uh, vacant. Um, um, you know, the the government might might try and hold that out as a you know as a um, a carrot and say, look, we can go across the road, but the reality is that they can't. Um, and so you, you have this very high high level of um, uh, rent renewal. That's very different to, and this is an interesting aspect of of um, uh, easterly government's portfolio is that um, there are other REITs that you can get exposure to uh, government tenants, but um, they're more focused on Washington DC, for example, and they're more focused on generic office space. Um, and in that case, uh, the government can at the end of a lease say, look, you know, we can get a better deal across the road. Um, and so they often do move to the cheaper space. But um, uh, in, in easterly government properties uh, case, uh, it's not it's not easy for them to do that. And so it's a really important differentiator. Okay, I think that's a, you know, an, a theme that we see within the portfolio. And, and you, as you've been talking today, you know, you illustrate some of the companies that you hold where the rental income stream is actually much more robust than the broader market itself. And hence, hence the level of retail exposure in, in the portfolio at present. We have had a question come in about the US exposure. It's a large com component of the portfolio. It's also a large component of the index, obviously. But what yep. about the um, valuation of the US market as a whole? What about the US election? What about their poor handling of the COVID crisis. Is this having a, an, a, a, a sort of top-down macro effect on your thinking? Yeah, so it is. I mean, we um, definitely don't, we do not look at it and say we want to have X percent exposure to uh, the US. What we look at is from a bottom-up point of view is what type of real estate do we want to be invested in uh, and where can we get that exposure? Um, and so, um, yes, all of those macro considerations are, are going to our thinking, um, but it's more about where can we get exposure to the likes of uh, data centers and towers. And so, um, uh, unfortunately, that um, exposure, as you see it uh, depicted in in the uh, in the slides, um, is by uh, listing domicile. So, for example, uh, uh, Equinix, which is our you know largest exposure to data centers, about five percent of the portfolio. Um, it's really a global company, just listed in the US, um, and uh, that's where we can get exposure to that. So it, it falls into the US bucket. Um, and similarly, when we look at, uh, for example, in logistics. Um, we uh, are invested in Prologis. It's the largest single exposure in the portfolio, and um, it really is a somewhat of a global company. It's a big uh, skew to the US, but it has exposure to Asia and uh, to Europe and the UK as well. And um, again, what we do and the way in a, the way our research process works is that we're able to uh, compare and contrast uh, within the same sector, so within the industrial sector, and look for where where we can find the best risk adjusted returns. And um, in the case of industrial, we, we scour the world and we look for uh, all the names that we can potentially invest in. And um, uh, if we find another company that we really like, uh, and I could use uh, Goodman as an example, we'll do a lot of work on it, a lot of research, uh, a lot of due diligence on it. Uh, and ultimately, if we find that um, the best risk adjusted returns are in um, Prologis as opposed to Goodman, then we're not afraid to uh, allocate more capital to uh, the one that we think has got the best risk adjusted returns. And in, in the case, in that example, um, we have felt for a long time that um, as, as good of a company as, as Goodman is, um, uh, Prologis just, just offers a, a better risk adjusted return because it has much more uh, rental exposure. Uh, compared to Goodman, which has a lot of funds management and uh, development uh, earnings uh, in in its um, uh, in its income statement, so 
um, uh, that de therefore results in a higher weighting to the US, um, but it's um, to us more about the bottom up analysis of the investment opportunities that, that we see. Um, and um, obviously the, the, the macro drivers come into it, but um, we, we, we also look at where they're exposed and, and many of those US companies do have um, uh, offshore exposure that actually reduces the look through uh, exposure to the US. Okay, thank you. A um, couple more questions. I had an interesting question in relation to office, but it is kind of more more broadly appropriate. Are there, have you seen any interesting strategies or tactics that have impressed you from from REIT management or the, the, the management teams of REITs? Um, or is it too early? Um, or are most of them just re preparing for things re to return to normal? Uh, yeah, so I guess the, the strategies have, tend, well, the ones that they've communicated at least has been most focused on uh, preparing uh, their buildings for return to work, and that's been reducing contact points. Um, uh, so, um, uh, making sure that, and also, and, and as you see, I mean, we've we've travelled to Hong Kong for many many years, and you know, it's, it was very obvious that you would see um, a very visible um, uh, cleaning services. So people are cleaning um, uh, lift buttons and and uh, the, the the lobbies and the foyers. Whereas in most other markets, you know, it's, it's all uh, sort of done uh, after hours. So it's it's about. Um, uh, changing their practices to some extent, uh, um, uh, being more visible about their um, uh, cleaning and, and the services that they offer, uh, and um, uh, and reassuring uh, their tenants that um, their air conditioning systems have got you know HEPA filters that you know um, can can be um, that make sure that you know very high and pure air and, and fresh air comes into the buildings uh, quite regularly. Um, uh, there's a little bit of talk about, you know, uh, low-rise buildings being um, uh, having a competitive advantage because you, you won't be uh, waiting in long, uh, long queues. Um, but um, you know, I think uh, we saw that before in, you know, uh, at, in 9/11, and um, um, you know, people for for a while said that no one would ever occupy a high-rise office building. Um, but um, uh, you know, that that uh, eventually turned around. So um, uh, we think that predominantly it'll be more about the, the more modern buildings, the more environmentally efficient buildings, uh, and those that have got um, uh, hygiene standards as um, uh, the ones that um, uh, attract the most uh, uh, tenants. Okay, thank you. And one one last uh, quick question is: uh, you mentioned about uh, frequent trips to Hong Kong. Obviously, that's not possible at mm. the moment and or anywhere in the world so how are you staying on top of the businesses that you own and um is it sufficient uh, to just have interaction with company management rather than actually doing site visits we we we'll prefer we always prefer to um wear out the shoe leather and uh, get out there and uh, um, walk the assets um fortunately for us we've been doing this for a long time um so uh we've you know seen many of the markets and um a lot of the assets and and walked many of them for um uh, many many years so i think we're reasonably familiar with them um uh, interestingly in terms of contact with management as you raise uh, we're, we're probably getting uh, the the ironic thing about uh, COVID is we're, we're almost getting uh, inundated with opportunities to meet with management. Um, it's so much easier now, obviously, with um, uh, video conferencing um, to organise a, a meeting with people, and um, uh, it's almost um, uh, essential that you turn your video on. Um, so it, it feels somewhat like a meeting. We don't think it's quite the same. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, there, there is the opportunity for us to actually um, attend more conferences, uh, you know, virtual conferences. Um, so we're still getting out there in that respect, um, but we are um, uh, looking forward to the opportunity to get out there and, uh, and walk the, uh, the assets again um, as soon as we can. What's the uh, what's the funniest incident you've had on any video meetings? Oh, it's usually kids walking walking into the <laughs> into the room, um, and um, so that's uh, that's that's usually the uh, um, the most obvious one that uh, that we've seen. All right, uh, that's a, a regular occurrence in my household. Mm -hmm. Marco, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, we run slightly over time. Uh, really appreciate you spending today with us and, and giving your insights into the global REIT markets. Keep up the good work. Um, the uh, performance is phenomenal. We've just gone past the four-year birthday. 
um, yes, of, of the Negri Group Investments Fund th th this week. Um, and really pleased to see that we're just outside the top decile in the European universe of, uh, of Global REIT Peer Group. Um, so thanks uh, for joining us. Um, to everybody else out there, thank you. I think you've heard today that the focus resolution have on high quality building strong management um, and uh, the flexibility that they have to move assets around the world um, to all a really diverse range of underlying uh, sub property types is something that could really benefit in 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 volatile times. Um, as we emerge from the current environment, I think you'll agree that resolution have proven that they have uh, the ability to and they've mastered this skill of moving money around to the, the most attractive uh, global re companies. Quick reminder that later today we have at 4 p.m. we have Ian Beattie from NS Part Partners providing us with some optimism. Um, a strange and scarce thing in the current market um, and going where uh, other market participants fear to tread and predicting a v-shaped recovery in emerging markets so be sure to log on later to hear why and then finally um, in this round of neg group investment insights of manager manager quarterly updates tomorrow morning we have the rescheduled call with anthony sedgwick from ABAX Investments, our portfolio manager on the Rainmaker Fund, who will share his current thinking on the prospects for South African equities. So once again, thank you, Marco. Thanks for everyone joining us today and from myself and everyone at Negroup Investments. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.